Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all for uh, thank you all for coming to the February Local History Guild, um, uh, middle of winter, uh, and I reckon it, I, I didn't we didn't really want to do something really super heavy, you know, like uh, like a like a major book talk or or something like that. So uh, instead, I thought I'd, we'd pull together something light. Except as it turns out, as you could see, it's not that light. Uh, it's actually you know we got some heavy hitters here. Um, the idea is a sort of show and tell, and we're gonna, and, you know, in, and uh, these are colleagues and, and friends, uh, people who, you know, work at the museum or have worked at other institutions or have interned here or a whole host of things. Um, and, uh, and we just, uh, we just, you know, we, we're all interested in, in, in the stuff, you know, of, uh, of uh, the stuff literally of our history. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, so it's a show and tell tonight. Uh, my name is Mike Dyer. I'm the curator of maritime history here at the New Bedford Whaling Museum. Um, and, uh, and I'm gonna start us off where, you know, we've got a full panel here. So uh, this is probably gonna take, I suspect it might actually take an hour, uh, you know, to, you know, if everybody gets, you know, five or five or six or eight minutes, um, you know, it, it's liable to go the whole way. Um, so uh, I'm gonna get us started um, with an odd, with an odd thing. And uh, the odd thing is this. Polynesian stone fish hook. It said in the catalog that it was uh, donated in 1933. And that it was uh, it came from the Marquesas Islands in, in the Pacific Ocean. And being the diligent curator that I am, you know, I dug into, you know, Polynesian island fish hooks, Marquesas Islands, and it doesn't come from there. Um, it's Polynesian. There's no two ways about that. But it actually, uh, it actually comes from Rapa Nui, um, in uh, which is Easter Island, which is Polynesia. Um, but this is a um, these are these were cherished uh, objects made out of basalt stone. Um, and it took a long time to make them. And once they were made, they were, um, they were, they were cherished family uh, possessions. This is a tuna hook um, for, uh, for catching tuna. Now, you might ask, why is a tuna hook from Rapa Nui in the Pacific Ocean on a local history guild talk? Well, the story is that what happened was, and it's actually kind of a tragic story. Um, but it's a local history story nonetheless, and that is that this was donated by a um, by a New Bedford businessman. His family stretched on both sides, clear back into this uh, mid 17th century. Um, they they were they lived in and and uh, and worked in Massachusetts, Weymouth, um, Mansfield, Taunton, um, here in New Bedford, um, and uh, this fella. Uh, had, was married. He had four kids, and um, in, uh, he was a member of the historical society. Very interested in in um, privateering and the American Revolution. Um, he gave talks at the at the old Dartmouth, uh, and his father donated maps and charts and things to the collection. And I'm not going to give his name simply because. I'm not going to give his name. Um, so, what happened was in July 8, uh, 18, uh, 1933, he donated his collection of Polynesian uh, objects, uh, including this, you know, really sweet mother of pearl fish hook uh, and bone fish hook, which is also Polynesian. And then three days later, uh, he went to his office at the Chamber of Commerce and blew his brains out. Um, he committed suicide. Uh, this was this was in it, during the Great. This is in the tail end of the Great Depression, according to his obituary. Uh, he, he was in fact suffering financial difficulties. Um, so that's the local history end of the story, the backstory to some of these things, um, which is, you know, it's what makes museum work a little complicated sometimes. Um, interesting for sure, but it re really makes you wonder about the motivations uh, for a man who's married with three kids 
gives his collection to the local historical society before taking his own life. So um, that's the start of the program. Um, and uh, I know that that's not a particularly cheery start. Uh, I could make it cheery. Uh, he also donated this bizarre scrimshaw um, model of a, of a uh, 1886 darting gun that he got personally from the Frank Brown collection. Frank Brown took over from Ebenezer Pierce and was a was a uh, a um, a uh, whalecraft manufacturer, and that's just a strange and wonderful thing. Why anybody would bother to make a model of of a scrimshaw model when they had the actual tool? Uh, who knows? Um, but uh, so that's a little cheery, and uh, <laughs> that's a little better than the last ending. Um, so I'm going to uh, be quiet uh, and 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 turn this uh, conversation over to. Uh, my friend and colleague, uh, Mr. Nick Taradash. Um, Nick was an intern with us for a while and went on to do great things, um, studying at Sotheby's and working at the Nantucket Historical Association. He's been a collector and an enthusiast of antiques, antiques, antiques across the board. Nick knows and loves antiques. Mr. Taradash, if you unmute yourself, we would love to hear what you want to talk about tonight. Thanks so much, Mike. Uh, that was fantastic. Um, I absolutely love that. Um, and thank you for sharing that. Um, everybody, my name is Nick Taradash, and I'm uh, so pleased to be here with you all tonight. Um, and uh, I still wasn't, I have, my, I have my dogs here in the back and they snore a lot. So if that's a problem, just let me know. Um, I'll, uh, I'll banish them. Uh, they're not snoring loudly now, but uh, if they do, I might remove them anyways. Um, I wasn't sure what I was going to share on uh, up until uh, the last minute, but uh, I think I've settled on uh, uh, on this one item because um, I know that uh, this particular item came from, um, I, I, I live in Tiverton and I grew up here in, uh, in Tiverton, Rhode Island, and, and I know that this particular object did come from uh, Tiverton, and I was uh, pleased to have found this. Um, about uh, five years ago now, um, when I was uh, interning in New York, and I uh, I met a dealer there who I had interned with, um, and um, they turned me on to this piece. So, without further ado, uh, I have this little dome top uh, deck uh, box. Uh, it's a wallpaper box, and it's got a little piece of glazed glass there uh, with the initials P O which stands for uh, Phoebe Osborne. And uh, you'll see the, um, you know, some of the, the designs here on the side um, of, of this box, this wallpaper box. Um, and it's wonderful because it's lined on the inside with uh, old newspaper. And I'll get that up. And, and this is um, uh, newspaper, you can see here, right here in the corner, if I can get that in closely enough, it will say Tiverton right there. This is a Newport newspaper and I have a date on here, right in the corner, uh, which dates it to uh, 1819. Um, and, and it's wonderful. There's, you know, uh, advertising, you know, for uh, uh, housing and there's um, uh, just, uh, you know, advertising for books and um, uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a really wonderful uh, little piece. Uh, here. And uh, another wonderful thing that came with it was that it actually came with um, a few little contents inside. Uh, one of which is I'll share with you is this wonderful uh, little drawing, a pencil drawing uh, right here. Um, let me get that up and close to the screen. Uh, if you can see that well, uh, which I just, I absolutely love this. And, you know, and it was a little note on the back, um, let's see that there. Um, but very lightly right there in the pencil, it will say, um, I'll read it out. It will say, uh, Mr. and Mrs. G. Foster. Um, so I have, to Im I have to imagine that this was done um, by uh, Phoebe um, and uh, Osborne. Well, possibly not, um, but the other thing which we found in here was um, this little book um, and written inside, it says Grand, uh, Grandmother Osborne's Book of Riddles. Uh, and I'll read 
one of these riddles for you tonight uh, from this, this little um, book of riddles. I thought that would be fun. Um, and it's uh, four wings I have, which swiftly mount on high. On sturdy pinions yet I never fly. And though my bo body often moves around, upon the self same spot I'm always found. And like a nurse who chews the infant's meat, I break for a man before that he can eat. So uh, I can wait for an answer later, or I can share it now, which whichever you folks prefer. Mike, what do you, what do you think? Or, That's what the chat feature is for, right? Yeah, if people want to put that in, yeah, any yeah, guesses yeah. or anything like that. Maybe halfway um, through the program, I'll call you back and you can read it again. You got it. Yeah. So um, yeah. So these were found inside this um, this wonderful little dome top box, and I tried to do some research on Phoebe Osborne. Uh, I found that there was a Phoebe Osborne born here in Tiverton um, in, uh, in 1788 um, and who uh, moved out to um, uh, the Finger Lakes region of New York. Um, but one of, the, one of the tricky things is um, it, it's, it's difficult to know if that was, uh, she was born with the name Osborne. Uh, and because it was written Grandmother Osborne's um, Book of Riddles. I wonder if that uh, that Phoebe Osborne had married into the family, which I wasn't sure about. Um, which still more research needs to be done on that on my end. But also, it's a little bit difficult because of um, the uh, different spellings, um, and uh, that can be a little bit tricky too. So uh, that's my object there. Um, and uh, I'll sort of wrap it up there. And thank you so much for uh, letting me participate tonight. Thanks, folks. Thanks, Nick. Great piece. Um, you know, and, and everybody out there in the uh, in in Radio Land, um, you know, you can feel free to to um, you can feel free to ask any questions as you go along, um, and uh, and we'll uh, we'll get we'll get to you. We'll get them up. Um, so thanks, Nick. Cool box. Um, next, um, my uh, my friend and colleague uh, Jordan uh, Jordan Burson here from the Director of Collections here at the New Bedford Wheeling Museum. Jordan's got a really interesting story. What's your story, Jordan? Uh, very nice to be with you all tonight. I'm Jordan Burson, and I'm speaking to you from the corner of Sharp Street at Slocum Slocum Road in North Dartmouth, Massachusetts. I'm in my home. This is a little bit different than uh, what has been done previously on the local history guild. Uh, Mike implied he wanted me to showcase um, my time capsule home that I purchased about eight years ago from the original family who built it and lived here uh, for many years. And what I really wanted to do is start the uh, conversation standing next to a 18th century barn foundation that's right next to my house uh, because it's indicative, it's the last vestige of what this area had been, which was farmland and timberland and um, also a Portuguese feast and festival grounds. Uh, Sharp Street now joins Slocum Road to Rockdale. It's a pretty major uh, thoroughfare, but it used to be a dead end uh, on Rockdale. So um, I can't show you the front of the house. I'm going to uh, give you a little walking tour here. I'm gonna turn the camera around and show you what the house looked like when I bought it. Basically, um, what caught my eye originally was the garage door and the front door. Um, it looked kind of Jetsons-like and indeed people in the neighborhood refer to this as the Jetsons house. I've come to learn that. The first thing I did was um, sand down all painted surfaces to find the original color schemes and color match. Uh, to the original colors and that goes for the interiors as well. Okay, now I'm gonna show you some of the artifacts in the house. This is the bar room I'm sitting in and I think it's appropriate that it has sort of a colonial vibe uh, being on colonial farm grounds. And the first artifact I'd like to show you, uh, our illustrious MC Michael Dyer built himself from reclaimed wood that was found at the Cogs Hall Counting House building on Front Street. It's an 1832 building that was renovated and they were discarding historic lumber and he made this beautiful 
uh, bench that I keep in front of the hearth and enjoy very much. I augmented a lot of what came in the house and I should back up the story by saying the house had a lot of its original furnishings when I bought it um, with New Bedford themed period uh, decorative items like this Ballantine Ale Ed and some other decorative pieces indicative of pieces in the New Bedford Whaling Museum collection. And um, right over here, one of my favorite activities, drinking ice cold Ballantine out of my Lincoln Park glass, which you'll get to watch me enjoy. Okay, moving onward. This lamp was purchased new by the guy I got it from at the New Bedford Whaling Museum gift shop in the 1960s. The people who lived here had a lot of pride of ownership. They kept the place very much the same. And the first thing a lot of people notice when they come here is that there's a barber shop in the basement. So there's a reason for that. Among the articles in the house that I found were archival papers. This is a letter from the Board of Registration of Barbers dated December 23rd, 1946 to Mr. Gilbert Gonsalves, who was the owner of this house. Um, and they asked him to appear December 30th uh, to be certified as a barber. And he had to go to the doctor and get a note that said he is free from contagious and infectious disease. And he saved a lot of the ephemera related to um, his association with the Master Barbers of Greater New Bedford. And all of this stuff I keep in place because it's, in my opinion, pretty cool. Uh, before we go upstairs, I wanna show you another one of my favorites. This clock, um, I don't know if it's hard to see, was hanging in Novick's jeweler store next to the Cherry and Company department store on Purchase Street. I don't know how it came to be in this house. Just pardon a moment while I go up the stairs. Part of what makes the time capsule house the time capsule house is the originality of things. So they bought really nice appliances and even saved all the brochures. The lighting fixtures in the house are basically original also. I had them restored by Danny King of King's Lighting on Hathaway Road. And he also did the museum's 1880s Mount Washington crystal chandelier. If you go to the Shapiro Gallery, you'll see that there. So about the family, I have a lot of documentation related to them. Um, after becoming a certified barber, uh, about 14 years went by and he and his wife became citizens. The documents were wrapped in red, white, and blue ribbons. And um, they were living in a multifamily dwelling on Court Street and decided at some point they had enough money to buy a new house. And they were reading the local papers and learned about a big development being planned here in Dartmouth. So what happened was <clears throat> they ended up buying three plots of land and they drew out the plot, they cited the house, they got a custom set of plans and built it to their specifications. And any new house needs furniture. So they took themselves down to Alpert's. This building apparently used to exist at Kempton and New uh, Purchase Streets, which is approximately where the lighthouse is today. And what's interesting is of all this furniture on this list, um, almost all of it's still here. The two piece sectionals in the basement, uh, the break front china cabinet, well, there it is. Dining room table, chairs, everything. And they apparently had enough extra money left over to travel back to Portugal for various trips where they collected ephemera and even invested in real estate um, and owned this hotel, the Orpheum, which I think was sort of a rooming house. Uh, and I would imagine somewhere near the Orpheum in the South End. Hey, Jordan, I'm gonna to have to interrupt you. We're gonna to have to move on to Melanie. Okay, well, I'm done. I just wanted to say that the people who lived here had their first child in 1961, the year they moved here. 
And from my interpretation of all of this, this was the American dream. <laughs> Have you spoken to any of the family? Uh, not exactly. I met the son at the closing. That's a fantastic thing. I'm sure people are going to, now that you've advertised, I'm sure you're going to have, yeah, <laughs> you're going to have lots of interest. <laughs> people on this panel might have been here. Thank you, Jordan. <laughs> Thank you. Melanie. Hi. What's going on at the Duxbury Historical Society? Oh, lots or, of fun things. Or, or, do you, um, or, or are you talking Duxbury or are you talking personal stuff to me? No, I am talking Duxbury. All right. Um, and so I, my item is too big, so I'm going to be the first person to share my screen, though. A tour of a whole house is pretty impressive, Jordan. <laughs> that was great. Um, so let me share my screen with you all. Let me know if you can't see anything. Um, so my name is Melanie, like Mike said, I'm the collections manager at the uh, Duxbury Rural and Historical Society in Duxbury, Massachusetts, which is about an hour north of um, New Bedford, sort of near Plymouth, in case anybody's not familiar. Um, and I am actually showing you one of my favorite things in our collection um, for a number of reasons, but it is actually a toilet. Um, so this commode is uh, called Mule's Dry Earth Commode. It was patented in 1869. So um, interesting for us specifically because it was found in one of our historic houses. So at the DRHS, we own a number of historic house properties, uh, two of which operate as historic house museums. And while we were reinterpreting one of the houses in the last number of years, um, this and a number of other items were found in a storage room in the house that was fairly inaccessible to us uh, before then. This just kind of, once it's closed, it just looks like a regular furniture piece. And it wasn't until we opened it that we realized what we were looking at. Um, and so a little background. So Henry Mole was a reverend in England. Um, he was born in 1801 and basically started working on a indoor facilities use type of item in the um, 1850s after witnessing the cholera epidemic in England in the late 1840s and the early 1850s, um, realizing that a lot of the, you know, what had happened was due to unsanitary conditions and that this would help alleviate some of that. Um, it was popular at the time. Um, he first patented in Britain in 1860 and then it sort of moved over and was then patented in America in 1869, which is the year of this model. Um, and so I'm gonna show you next slide so you can see kind of how it's used. Um, so this actually has dry earth in it. So it does not use water to flush the waste. Um, and it very much was in competition with the water closet, which is what we ultimately ended up with. Um, but this actually has sifted earth in it. And Mool and advertisers subsequently who were sort of creating these items used these, uh, purported the health benefits of it and also the sort of sustainability of it. Um, it was a closed system. So um, unlike, you know, areas, rural areas in particular, um, where there was not town sewer for water closets to push the waste out into, you ended up with a lot of cesspools or, you know, just wasn't like affordable for rural communities. Um, this one, so basically you pull the lever here, I'm pointing at it like if you can see me, you can pu pull the lever here and the earth would fall down um, into the big bucket or chamber pot or whatever you had underneath where you were sitting. Actually, I think if you can see um, here, you can kind of see how it was used in the, this is a later patent that patents from 1909, um, but it basically is using the same sort of system. Um, interesting for us as interpreters of the Bradford Museum, um, so what we were basically doing was changing the history, not changing the history of the house, but changing what we told on our tours to focus on the lives of the four girls who grew up in the house in the 1860s, um, I'm sorry, in the 1800s. And so this and a number of, we know that they the parents who built the house in 1808 had four daughters who lived to adulthood, only one of which married. The other three basically lived their entire lives through the 1890s in the house. Um, 
and it was interesting for us to sort of reinterpret that story and also to have items that they may have used. Um, personally, for me, as someone who's interested in material culture and like what we talk about in historic settings, bathroom facilities is not necessarily one of them. Um, but we know that this was in the house and we know that it was actually part of one of the number of items that was found that was specifically used for um, immobility or was to help aid. The Bradford daughters um, cared for their grandmother and their mother, both of whom aged in the house and were um, immobile for the most part. Elizabeth, who was the second youngest daughter, um, also suffered a stroke at, later on in her life and was fairly immobile. Um, and all of these items were discovered in the house to sort of assist with that type of um, issues that they were having. This was also found in the same storage facility that the um, commode was in. It was in the rafters, it was hard to get out. Um, we were able to pull it down. It is an early invalid bed. Um, and this chair here, which I'm not sure if you can see if you move the little, um, probably my face, but that's actually in a 1700s chair. It's a late 18th century chair that was retrofitted into a wheelchair so that they were able to sort of move um, you know, their grandmother or sister around. Also the, um, the commode is interesting today. It's actually still the precursor for contemporary compost toilets. Um, with this sort of green eco movement that we're sort of seeing, um, tiny houses, things like that. People use composting toilets now. Um, and so the earth could be sifted in this version up to seven times. And then they say you can use it as fertilizer. Um, and that's kind of the same sort of method that I guess people are using today. Um, so that is basically it. I'm gonna stop sharing. Well, that was the most astonishing thing I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> um, <laughs> what a great collection. Yes, thanks. It was really a fun find. And um, it is actually one of my favorite things. It's, a, it's sort of a weird thing to talk about, but it's, it's one of the things you don't normally hear about. And, but it is something that's it's literally universal. Um, Get this, Melanie. I talked to a guy came into the museum today. He has a huge collection of all kinds of stuff in his, it was his, his wife's mother's collection, including a collection of antique toilet paper. Antique toilet paper. He says he has a collection of antique toilet paper and she collected old rolls of toilet paper. Well, if it goes back to 1860, I might have to hit you up for uh, a while. There, there you have it. <laughs> to go with the toilet. <laughs> well, thanks for inviting me and letting You're me welcome. share my weird things with you guys. Hey, Abby, I think we're going to, I don't see Eric, so I think we're going to go right to you. Are you, uh, what do you reckon? Yeah. You ready um, I messaged him. He had a death in the family. Oh, dear. Okay. Well, that's very sad. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, uh, so what do you reckon? Are you, you ready to go? Yeah. Hello. Fantastic. Hi, hello everybody. My name is Abby. Thank you for coming. That was really cool. I did not expect to learn about toilets today, but I'm happy that I did. <laughs> um, I will also be sharing my screen, not because the item I'm sharing is particularly large, but more like awkward to display on the screen. And it's, yeah, okay. Anyway. <laughs> I'll just answer quickly, Abby, while you're figuring that out. <laughs> um, <laughs> It was kind of our idea. We didn't want to talk about death and aging and disability in the house. Um, so once we realized that we had such like a cache of like sort of rare-ish items, we wanted to make sure that we were sort of telling that story where it's not just about the vibrant lives that they lived, which they did as like civil war nurses and abolitionists and a whole bunch of things, but like also the fact that you age and suffer is really part of like that human experience. Um, so that was kind of that whole thing. Really I mean, interesting. Looks, looks great. So I'm excited. We're getting there, Abby. We see some cool stuff. It's, okay, I did it. Ha <laughs> 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 ha. I'm an adult who knows how to use the internet. Um, okay, so the thing that um, I wanted to talk about was this. Um, I don't have the right mannequin for it, but it is a um, like set late 1790s up to maybe like 1805-ish um, round gown. And I actually found it in a home in, um, in Rochester because sometimes benevolent old people will let me poke around their houses and then they give me 
um, things like this, <laughs> the, this um, Georgian gown. Um, and what's really cool about it is that um, I took this picture here, if you can see it. Um, the skirt is actually not comprised of one or one. Usually, if you were making a reproduction of this and you had enough fabric, you would probably only cut the skirt in like three pieces, um, the side panels and the back panel. Um, but because the sizes are the selvage to selvage width of fabric um, and looms at this time were quite a bit smaller than they are today. Um, they did this thing called piecing, which is um, where you have these extra, these are seams um, in the skirt and there's other ones through here. Um, and that was done because they needed it to get more volume, but fabric was really precious. Like this um, embroidery was done by hand because they didn't have the um, capabilities that we have now and technology that we have now um, to have machine embroidery. So you can see the fabric is extremely right. fine. And um, so yeah, all these flowers and it's totally covered with flowers were done by hand. And the reason that I chose this other than the fact that I found it in a local home, this is the back by the way, um, is because I think it speaks to the like cosmopolitan nature of um, this area, like New Bedford and um, like the greater Boston area where such, um, I mean, they were huge ports, right? Um, this fabric was produced, the super fine muslin fabric was produced um, in Asia, like um, India often. And um, of course, um, the embroidery being done by hand wasn't like, <laughs> oftentimes wasn't being done by like people getting, it's not, not dissimilar from today where if you buy $12 pair of jeans new at um, the Gap, you're not getting it from ethical labor practices, right? <laughs> um, and I think what's interesting about this dress is that um, it, if you look at the way it's sewn, it's sort of, it's a bit haphazard and um, the, like there's not like um, a high level, an extremely high level of skill in the way that the different pieces are cut. Um, so like in dressmakers um, shops at the time, um, you had a whole separate person who would do the cutting, whose like main skill <laughs> in life was cutting the fabric um, because it was so precious. Um, so because there's not a uniformity in the way it was cut, like I think it was likely made by someone in their own home. Um, so I think it's really interesting that um, they were able to afford um, this fabric that was produced continents away, um, but weren't able to afford to have the dress made by a dressmaker and weren't able to afford enough fabric that they didn't have to do piecing in the skirt. Oh. Um, so I just think it shows it, it, like kind of an interesting middle of the road, um, uh, like socioeconomic bracket, because most of the time the clothes that you see that survive the best are um, people who had a lot of money. Um, and I just, I just think it's neat. Is this yours? Do you own this? It is mine. Yeah. It, it, uh, when it is not on my dress form, which is almost never, except for when I need to take a picture, it lives in our in archival box. I'm, I'm a little confused. Is this, is it button in the front? Are we looking at the front or the back? Yeah, that's the front. It doesn't fit properly on my dress form. Initially, I, I do have a reproduction of a, um, un, like an undergown that this would have been worn over. Um, oh. But uh, it, the, the reproduction I made like for myself and I am larger than the person who <laughs> owned um, originally owned this 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 original dress but yeah so um, the piece here would have met in the front I obviously yeah, just right, didn't right, want right. to strain the fabric um, and the the most of the clothing at the time actually pinned shut um, with straight pins you would wear it over um, like a pair of short stays and there would be a busk in the front it was um, to sort of make everything flat, but also to protect you from not getting skewered by straight pins. Yeah. <laughs> oh. um, but Have it's you ever really... seen an example of this in art or a painting or anything? Oh yeah, um, I mean, actually, you know, I can just pull up the, the old Google. Um, I don't know. Yeah, 
There's a really famous one that I'm thinking oh, wow. of. Oh. Um, they wore these overgowns. Mm -hmm. It's not dissimilar from the way that this, uh, I it's not, that's an apron front dress. Hold on. Mm -hmm. It would have been worn over something that looked somewhat like this, but with huh. sleeves. That was originally what I was going to put it on the mannequin over. Yeah, well, it. you could see off the shoulder, it's very, and the, very deep in the front. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, And this was a local thing. Where did you find this? I found it in um, in a in a house in in Rochester. In Rochester, that's what you said. Yeah. Um, see this this is an example of a gown that pins shut under in sort of a um, a more structural um, under piece, and then the front ties with these little drawstrings at the upper part of the bust and just at the under bust. I have a question about the so does it oh yeah it pins it pins together till just under the bust and then it's open or does it pin all the way down it pins both um so this part pins um just at where like the bust line or the neckline of the dress would begin and right. then up until here yeah yeah the under bust and then it would be open i'm trying to find a okay. good example of um of a portrait uh but i am presently having some trouble <laughs> I think uh, I can picture the one you're looking for too. <laughs> yeah, like <laughs> I, may, I may have to cut you off, Abby. We're gonna, we may have to move on to the next. That's uh, totally fine. I to, um, I feel bad. Brian, that I can't but that, find a you know, this is, uh, uh, here is a good example, but it's in um, like um, satin. See, it's sort of crisscrossed. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's that's that is my. Huh. But, uh, how do I stop screen sharing? Stop sharing. Oh, yeah, I just think it's neat. Fabulous. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. All right, time is marching on, and we are ready for Mr. Brian Fernandez. Um, Brian contacted me some weeks back to sort of build collaboration between the New Bedford Masons and the Whaling Museum because there's some interesting overlapping history there. And, uh, you know, I went up and did my dog and pony show for uh, the fine people um, at the lodge. And, uh, you know, immediately thought, you know, wow, Brian, uh, Brian's going to be a great uh, show and tell. So uh, welcome, Mr. Fernandez. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Uh, my name is Brian Fernandez. I'm the historian at Star and East Lodge, which is the oldest lodge in New Bedford. We were chartered in 1823, and we're about to have our 200th anniversary at the Whaling Museum in 2023. And... Um, what I just like to, before I get into my display, I got to say, uh, as a public service announcement, forget everything you have ever heard about Freemasonry. Uh, we are a, a social organization, primarily, and um, we also fall, it's also a, you know, a, a self-improvement group, okay? And we use themes of building a building towards building, you know, a better person. And so, which is why we wear the aprons. This is an apron. They were made of leather. I don't know if you can see that well, and they were hand painted. And this is from 1824. This is from 1824. And um, there's a lot of symbolism on there. I know people are told that uh, things in Freemasonry are secret. Um, we, our self-improvement is built upon uh, similar to the stoicism and the virtuous uh, life. And so, the secrets are just really a test of your um, fidelity is all it is. So it, it's nothing that you can't find on the internet. But um, so anyway, I will move on to uh, what I wanted to talk about today, which is uh, I will share my screen for a bit because, and I, and I can show you it live because the, the picture has a lot of glare to it. But this is a picture of Abraham H. Howland Jr. from 1883. 
And uh, he reached the level of Grand Master of Masons in Masonry of uh, Boston, which is of Massachusetts, which is the highest uh, rank that you can reach in Masonry. He was also the 14th mayor of New Bedford. Um, but what I wanted, and then I can show you, this is the actual uh, photo that hangs here in the lodge. And I, you have some glare there. But um, the reason I wanted to talk about him is because uh, he, he comes with a, a great history uh, for New Bedford. The Howlands uh, uh, you know, have a, a long history in New Bedford, but it goes back even before that to England. Um, John Howland, uh, he came over on the Mayflower and he's a pretty famous guy. And he's, he's in the same uh, Howland uh, descendancy as Abraham H. Howland Jr. He was on his way, he was a servant for um, um, John Carver. And uh, a funny story about him is as they're coming over on the Mayflower, he is thrown <laughs> overboard in the middle of the night and uh, with luck, he happens to grab a rope. Nobody had known he'd fall over. He grabs a rope that's tra trailing behind the Mayflower and he pulls himself on board. And um, he was called the lucky pilgrim after that. And so he gets, uh, he gets to uh, Plymouth and uh, the first winter, everybody in most of the colony dies, including uh, Bradford and his, and his wife. And so uh, jo John uh, Howland inherits all of Carver's estate. And the, uh, another uh, woman who died was Elizabeth uh, Tilly, and she was 14 years old. Her entire family died. And so he cared for her for a couple of years and two years later they got married and they had 10 children. Uh, and the descendants of them, there's more than 2 million of them here today uh, in, the, in the United States today and in uh, and, and the world. Some of them are uh, uh, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow and uh, um, uh, Winston Churchill, for the presidents, Franklin Roosevelt, uh, Nixon, the Bushes, Sarah Palin. Uh, there's there's a whole list. It's it, it's 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 you should Google it because it's it's amazing. If he doesn't grab a hold of that rope, it's amazing. You know what would have happened possibly in World War II with Franklin Roosevelt, and Winston Churchill not being uh, around. But so he survives that first winter, and then he also uh, almost survives uh, being shot, and uh, he reaches a, a pretty level of. Uh, status in Plymouth. He's one of the leaders there. And he actually uh, is the last surviving male passenger of the Mayflower. But um, because the Quakers in, um, in Plymouth uh, disagreed with paying taxes to uh, support a military, they, that's why they came here to Bedford. They purchased, uh, you know, under questionable circumstances, purchased the land here from Massasoit and um, settled here uh, in a Quaker settlement. And so um, that's where we come to Abraham H. Howland, uh, Abraham H. Howland Jr.'s father. Um, he uh, was the first mayor of New Bedford. He uh, was in the business of whaling. He was a ship owner and he was one of the first to refine petroleum. He was a Massachusetts legislator for three years. And he was, and as I said, he was the first mayor of New Bedford. He spent four terms in that office. He was also a Mason. Um, his son, who is the subject of my talk today was Abraham H. Howland Jr., born in New Bedford on May 29th, 1840, uh, and he served as the 14th mayor. Um, he also served as many Masonic orders, which he was a member. He was a director of the utility company, a director of several banks, and he was the chief of the fire department, as well as participating in many civic groups. Uh, his Masonic career was honorable. He was elected to receive his degrees in Eureka Lodge, which uh, it does not exist anymore, but it was the second uh, oldest lodge in New Bedford. And they, um, he was raised in March uh, 3rd of 1865. And eventually uh, in 1871, he was appointed district deputy, grand master, went through the chairs. And in uh, 1883, uh, he, at the age of 43, he was elected to become the youngest grand master of Grand Lodge of Massachusetts. Uh, he was reelected re unanimously and completed a three-year term at that position. When he journeyed to Washington, D.C. in February of 1885 for the dedication of the Washington Monument, he took with him by request Paul Revere's golden urn, which housed a lock of Washington's hair. And that urn become part, became part of the ceremony at which the Grand Lodge of Massachusetts was recognized as the senior Grand Lodge of the United States. So, was, you know, for Masons, it was a, it was a pretty uh, big uh, celebration. Um, he died 
uh, Young. He died on April 20th, 1887 at the age of 46 from meningitis. Um, at the time of his death, he was the youngest of eight surviving past Grand Masters. Um, he, uh, the Holland Ham family plot is located in Rural Cemetery on Dartmouth Street in New Bedford. And uh, named in the will of Mrs. Miss Mary Tucker Holland, Abraham H. Holland Jr. Lodge, which is one of the lodges in, that was formed after his passing uh, and is named after him and is in the building that I'm in, received a substantial bequest from the estate in 1930. So uh, Masons, this is one of the things that Michael and I are gonna work on. You know, when I started to do the history of our lodge 200 years, I kept coming across the same names, the, the people who formed this city, the people who, uh, you know, created the whaling industry and who were uh, significant in the whaling industry. And in a matter of fact, the whaling museum, what we call the Allen building, that was our lodge building. It's now part of the whaling museum. And it's at the top of Center Street uh, at the intersection. And um, that building was our lodge room from 1825 until 1840. So big connections between all of those. And I, I thought that uh, Abraham H. Holland Jr., we're proud of him. I think he's the city, he's a significant uh, character in the city. And so, like I said, I will show, this is him as grandmaster of Masons in Massachusetts um, in 1883. Hey, Brian, I got a question coming in from Bob Demanche. Bob, I think I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna let, I'm gonna let the speakers go through uh, and then we'll, 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 uh, we'll circle back to you if that's all right. Sure. All right. Thank you. Uh, so I looked, Brian, on the ceiling and I talked to the facilities department and there was no painting on the ceiling of that room. Um, so, okay. but you know, it, it was, uh, it was an interesting question and we, we really did sort of have to dig around a little bit to make sure that there were no, that there was no painting on the, on the roof of that room. Right. I know as of 1923 on the 100th anniversary, you know, cause every, every lodge has a, a constellation painted on its ceiling and, uh, it was in our records, it says that in, in 1923, uh, yeah, 1923, it was still there, but. <laughs> Allie. All right, hi everyone. Um, I'm Allie Copeland. I'm the art curator for the New Bedford Public Library. Um, thanks, Brian. We actually have two portraits of Abraham Howland Sr. and a couple of George Howland Jr., I believe as well. So we've got uh, quite a few Howlands in our art collection here at the library as well. Um, so that was really neat to see that photo. They have some great mutton, mutton chops. Um, but today um, I was debating about what to talk about, um, my favorite painting in the collection, or we just put up, um, I just finished installing a Japanese whaling scroll over at the art museum. Um, but I figured um, since he watches me work all day, um, I'm gonna do George Washington here behind me. Um, so our painting of George is a copy of probably from made from the uh, Gilbert Stewart, which hangs at the Providence State House. So Gilbert Stewart painted this portrait of Washington, which is known as the Lansdowne portrait. The original, original, the first one he painted uh, is in the National Portrait Gallery in Washington. And then Stewart himself made several copies. He did um, some in the Lansdowne style, and then this is the Monroe Lennox style. Um, so there's a few key differences. Um, what's on the table, uh, where his hands are in his pocket, the stance of his feet. Uh, there's a little bit less um, detail in the floor. Um, just small changes that um, the Lansdowne portrait portrays Washington as a statesman and the Monroe Lennox is Washington as a scholar. Um, so there's books, there's writing implements on the table and that kind of thing. So the three that Stuart painted are scattered around. There's one in the New York Public Library, one in the Providence State House, and then the third, I believe, is in Connecticut somewhere, but I, don't, I never remember the third one. Um, but this one, this particular painting, uh, one of the most copied paintings you'll find uh, in the country. Um, we have one, there's one across the street at the New Bedford um, City Hall in their council chambers. There's one in the Fall River Public Library. And there's in a lot of just government buildings, they have a copy of this particular portrait. Um, and when I say copy, obviously it's still a real painting. Someone sat down and painted it. They were just painting it from 
the original painting, assuming it's the one in Providence because that's the closest one to us. And we actually don't know the artist for this painting. Um, it's not signed. And as far as we know, um, there's no information about who created it. There is an old lining canvas on the back that's obscuring the original canvas. Um, so we, one of the other reasons I decided to do this today is we were recently uh, applied for money from the CPA to have this painting conserved. Um, so the hope, and it's a long shot, is that in the process of conservation, when they remove that canvas, there might be some information on the original canvas. You know, you never know. Um, so that would be amazing, but we may never know who painted it and that's fine. Um, because the real history of this painting is not necessarily who painted it, but who owned it. So the original owner as far back as I can tell is James Arnold. So I actually found this um, from one of the old Dartmouth historical sketches um, from Zephariah Pease, who says it hung in Arnold's dining room. And I know it's this painting and not the one that's across the street because it, it the, the actual sketch says it, that it had moved to the Union for Good Works. And I know that the provenance of this one goes from the Union of Good Works to the Boys Club of New Bedford, then to the First National Bank, and then to us. So I know that from that provenance that this is the one that would have been at in James Arnold's dining room. And I've been in that dining room. It's not huge. So this would have taken up a massive amount of space on that wall because it's about, I wanna say eight or nine feet tall. It's very large. <laughs> um, and so after he died, after James Arnold died and William J. Roach took over his estate, um, he was doing as Arnold had requested in his will and donating money to the Union for Good Works. I've actually been to the Whaling Museum Library uh, and look through the Roach papers to see if I could find any information about uh, Roach giving this painting to the Union for Good Works. Unfortunately, I didn't find anything. Um, it's someday I will. Um, but the, um, the, he did donate money to the Union for Good Works pretty frequently. There's a lot of receipts from them. Um, and they were just a, an organization that um, was funded to, I think, essentially help the poor and help the needy. Um, and they were located on 12 Market Street, which is now right across from the library. And then when the Union for Good Works dissolved, the Boys Club of New Bedford took over that building and the bank painting just stayed there. I assume it was very difficult to move out of the space, so they just kept it. And then when the Boys Club moved to their new building on Jenny Street, which is now the Boys and Girls Club, uh, they let girls join, uh, they left the... <laughs> they decided um, not to bring the painting with them. And there was a particular um, uh, person in the, in the higher ups of the boys club who also was associated with the first national bank, which is now Webster bank on the corner of um, Union and Pleasant, I believe. Um, and they, so they moved the portrait from Market Street down to first national bank and it hung in their lobby for a good number of years until that particular person who had initiated that transfer um, retired. And then I think everybody said, let's get rid of this old portrait of Washington. <laughs> and they put it in storage um, into their savings bank, which is now the New Bedford Art Museum. So if you go to the New Bedford Art Museum basement, they still have the original vault down there. So he was in the vault in the art museum. And then this businessman, Jacob Rubin, saw him in the vault down there I don't know it, for what reason he was down there, if he was associated with the bank or whatever, and basically said, we have to get this painting out of the vault. It's, you know, moldering away down here. We need to have, you know, it's a beautiful painting. We need people to see it. So he decided to bring it out and he was maybe going to sell it, but the library said, we'll take it. Uh, and they, it's hung here since 1970. So the other fun part about this is that we had a particular art historian who came through New Bedford, who saw this painting and was convinced that it was a real Stuart, that was an original Gilbert Stuart, which would mean it's worth millions. And we had a director at the time, Solomon, who bought in and he said, yes, it's a Stuart, I believe you, like this is a real thing. Uh, just for the record, nobody now believes this is a Stuart. <laughs> um, but he was, he totally bought in. And this guy's name was Mount, Charles Merrill Mount. 
he published on it. He, you know, was way into it. They were uh, applying for grants to get it conserved and, and all this other stuff. And uh, at some point, the, an Art News article got published. So Art News is a, is a journal in the art world. And they published like, basically, can you believe this idiot Mount? He thinks this is a real Stuart. There's no way it's a real Stuart, <laughs> this guy, you know? And, and basically sort of uh, uh, trashes Mount. And then uh, Mount gets mad and he sues them for libel. And so I have a ton of correspondence between Mount and the lawyers and uh, Solomon, our director, uh, basically <laughs> about this libel suit, about the Washington. I mean, literally four archival boxes of just correspondence. Mount yep. was way into it. <laughs> Local history is like making sausages, huh? Yeah. <laughs> so, so it's super fun to just read through and he gets testier and testier as the years go on. So this is like from 1978 to 1980. And then eventually the, the correspondence stops. I think Solomon was like, I'm done with this. We're not dealing with this anymore. We're just gonna put the painting up and say it's by an unknown artist. So it sort of got left there. The publishing, you know, the newspaper stopped publishing about it because there are some newspaper articles that are like, does New Bedford have a real Stuart? You know, there's a whole lot of stuff. But nowadays we say it's by an unknown artist and it's a copy of a Stuart and we're happy with that. That was great. Allie, thanks for the good history. I'm going to come up and uh, check out that painting. Yeah, please do. It's in the I, art room. So if anyone wants to come visit, yeah, right. it's right here in the art room. Anybody can go up and check it out, right? Yep. You just Free and open to the public. You just need to find your way up to the third floor. Exactly. All right. Thank you. Hey, Jim. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, everyone, for inviting me to participate in this. Um, I really appreciate it. <clears throat> Pardon me. Uh, my focus tonight is on Scrimshaw, the classic Scrimshaw, and I've always seen Scrimshaw, at least the whale's teeth that are engraved, as an art form. And in fact, if you look at the tooth generally as a canvas, you see the story that the engraver is trying to tell, and the stories are, are legion. They're stories, they're romantic, they're battle scenes, they're many, many references to whaling, religious scenes, not quite as common as the, as, the, uh, as the whaling scenes. And the methods that were used by the engraver, there are several, probably uh, the least common is the freehand drawing by a person, an engraver who has a real art talent. And these, they're beautifully done when they're done correctly. Then, then you have the second type, which is uh, again, a freehand drawing but the artist uses a model, not from the first, the first type that uses, the, the artist uses his own imagination of what something looked like. The second type, the artist, the engraver, uses a model or as an example. And the third type, we, which we call copying, is where the, with the artist, the engraver will take a, uh, a piece of paper, maybe wet it down, lay it along the tooth, pinprick the outline, remove the paper, and then connect the dots, inking it, and then you see the image. So we have those several types of, and there are others too, of how the tooth is engraved. Of late, people have been finding, very good with great fortune, the sources that were used by the engravers. And when you find the source, I mean, it really brings the tooth to life. It brings the scrimshaw to life. It validates the image. And it brings, it gives the tooth far more importance. Um, I, I brought a, a tooth that I think is fascinating to, uh, to show you. And it's a large tooth. I hope you can see this. And it can, is, is there too much brightness? How's that better? Yeah, that's good. Okay, you can see it says the peaceable kingdom. Okay. The Peaceable Kingdom is well known among Quakers. It's a concept from Isaiah chapter 11, which talks about, which again, the Quaker concept of, of harmony among all people on earth. The lion shall lie down with the lamb. Edward Hicks was an artist most well known for his variations of the Peaceable Kingdom. In fact, he, he uh, he painted 62 versions, known versions 
of the peaceable kingdom. Um, and Hicks was a Quaker minister and Quakerism was dominant in whaling in both New Bedford and Nantucket. What makes this tooth interesting, and I'll show you the picture again, beautifully engraved. Yeah. Unfortunately, I can't do a split screen, but I have the image, the yeah. source that was used by the engraver, which came from an 1846 Bible published by Harper and Brothers. And that, in fact, really brought the tooth to life because now you could see it was virtually identical line for line, but there are no pinpricks, which tells me that the engraver was a very, very talented artist who copied it from that image. The, um, the opposite side of the tooth, which is also interesting, is this nondescript, unidentified federal building. And I'm, when I first saw it, I said, you know, it could be a jail, it could be a post office, it could be anything. It looked like a building you might find in Washington, DC. So I was in touch with a friend who's an architect and literally within minutes, he wrote back to me and said, I found the image. <laughs> wow. The Naval Asylum in Philadelphia. Wow. And if you look at the image compared to the image on the tooth, it's right down to the exact same landscaping. Again, the engraver was, a, was an enormously talented artist who copied the image from this image, from this illustration, a lithograph. So now I have a tooth with two images and two sources. The, uh, the conclusions, and there's, it's speculation at this point, but it's interesting to speculate. I mean, Hicks, Hicks was a Quaker. Uh, Quakers were dominant in, in whaling in New Bedford. And it's likely that either this, it was the Naval, uh, the Naval Asylum was a lodging house and a retirement home. So the engraver could have retired to the asylum and did this tooth while he was there, or he was lodging there between voyages. And this was his expression of the home in which he lived. That's and great. as I say, it's speculation and I can't prove or you can't disprove, but it, it's a fascinating piece. And I, I, I'm, uh, I'm really happy to share what I've discovered. What are, the about date, it. what are the dates of those engravings again, Jim? The, the Naval Asylum engraving is not dated, Mike, but I would say, given the picture, I'd say it's probably in the 1830s, it, it started in 1826 and it went running right through 1976. So the engraving is somewhere around, I'd say 1830 to 1850. That's what it looks like, given the way, if you look at the, the way the people are dressed in this, which is the one that he used, if you can make out the way they're dressed. See that fellow there? Yeah, that clearly is something from mid, 1800s. That font looks 1838 to 1842 to me. Could be, could be, yeah. Yep. And then the uh, the date of the Bible is 1846, which again yep. is contemporaneous with what I think the date for the for the tooth is. Cool. It's a great. It's an it's an interesting piece, and it's fun to talk about it. So thank you Brilliant again. Piece. Thank you. Thank you very much. My pleasure. What do you reckon, Naomi? Well, I don't know if people are full. Um, I can be very brief or uh, we can pause for conversation. What do you think? Um, do you, you want to have real, Nick uh, reiterate? I'm gonna, his... Yeah, I was going to post that riddle uh, right in the chat for everybody. Go ahead. Go ahead and read it again. Nick. You got it. OK. Uh, four wings I have which swiftly mount on high, on sturdy pinions, yet I never fly. And though my body often moves around, upon the same spot, I'm always found. And like a nurse who chews the infant's meat, I break for man before that he can eat. And I'll post that in the chat there too. I got that copied and written down.
I think Naomi got it. I sent a private guess. So what do you think? Are we going to divulge or are we just going to sit here and look at each other? <laughs> Did you send that to me, Naomi? John, John, John uh, Watchtowitz says it's a windmill. Is that right? That's correct. It's, it's a, windmill. a windmill. All right. Congratulations, John. You are an official local history guild card carrying member. <laughs> So Naomi, you gonna finish us off? Sure, I'll be I'll be speedy. I don't need to drag people out, but I thought I'd um, bring out an object from the collection that I'm starting to think about here in preparation for an exhibition that we'll be organizing in the summer of 2023 that is focused on seaweed. Um, so the museum has a, a lot of different kinds of things that relate to, depict, or um, include actual seaweed. Um, seaweed, I think, is going to be a really fun topic for an exhibition because it has industrial uses, it has uh, sort of scientific themes to it, and then there's also, of course, a really strong uh, amateur interest in seaweed starting in the mid-19th century, and especially from women, which means that uh, there are lots of different topics and, and makers that we can focus on in the exhibition. And so this is an example, and I'm going to try and remove my camera from my computer just to show you this thing, and I'll stand up too. So we'll see if this works. We'll go way up here and see. Okay, can you yeah. Yeah. see? Okay. See yep. uh, so this was made by a woman, Sarah Sutcliffe, in around 1890. Uh, it came into the collection in 2017, and it's one of a number of essentially kind of amateur um, uh, pressings with uh, sea moss that create these kind of decorative forms and arrangements. They flatten out on this essentially kind of cardstock. This one she's done into kind of a, a wreath shape. Um, and you can see these are all different types of seaweed, sea moss. This one still has the little kind of berries on it. Um, uh, so there are 18 specimens on this one. Uh, and it has to sit flat because they are dried and they're actually, they've lost their adhesion to the paper. Um, so it's a delicate little thing. So I'll uh, that's your done. Uh, and say that um, for the exhibition, we're going to think about uh, local seaweed collecting, and we're also going to think about it in conversation with seaweed collecting in Normandy in the south of England. And again, uh, comparing kind of industrial uses for seaweed, scientific study of seaweed in the 19th century, and uh, amateur practices like Sarah Sutcliffe's, uh, who was making something um, as pure decoration based on what she could find on the beaches in the area. So. There we go. How did I do? <laughs> Quick, fast, perfect. speedy. <laughs> Absolutely perfect. Well, will you have cyanotypes of seaweed, says John. Yes, definitely. So Anna Atkins is the most famous, probably, uh, seaweed studier. Um, but uh, Henry Fox Talbot also made salt prints of seaweed very early on. Um, so in the 1820s, people were starting to do really early photography with seaweed collecting and um, uh, definitely hoping to include things like that. So uh, Brian Fernandez wants me to let you all know that the uh, AHA uh, will be held at the lodge uh, on the corner of County and Union on July 14th. So. Uh, so the AHA night will be uh, at, the, at, at the Masonic Lodge on July 14th. Um, uh, and um, obviously, thank you all. You did a great job. This has been completely fascinating. I loved every minute of the whole thing. Um, it's really great. Um, next month on March 10th, our local history guild is uh, focused on lighting the way. So uh, it's women at work. And... Um, I don't think I'm going to be hosting that. At least they haven't asked me to host it yet. I mean, I could host something. But 
you know, imminent work, um, but I'd have to read up about it. Um, so uh, nonetheless, we've come to that awkward part of the evening where we all have to leave. So we have to say good night um, and uh, thanks. And we'll see you all next time. Bye-bye. Bye, Mike. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thanks, Mike. Okay. This was Great a lot job, of fun. everyone. Good night.